What is happening guys? Cowboy here and I am super excited to finally be able to bring you guys more info about Code Vein. So it was hard to keep this one under wraps, but the other week Bandai Namco actually brought me out to San Francisco and I had a chance to go hands-on with the current build of the game. I was able to play for about two hours and I have roughly an hour and a half of just raw footage with me going through what's essentially the start of the game that I'll also be uploading. But in this video, we're taking a look at one of the optional dungeons in the game, and I wanted to do an updated gameplay impressions vid. And in addition to that, I had a chance to interview the producer of Code Vein while I was there, Keita Izuka. I've transcoded that interview, so we're going to be going in-depth into that, everything I asked them, and the juicy details I got. And then I'll be going into my impressions based on the current state of the game. So the first thing I asked them about was the multiplayer aspect of the game. Almost all the gameplay we see involves either the player and the NPC, or the player and another player going through, and I wanted to know the full breakdown of how multiplayer works in this game. And what I was told is that the base game consists of both you and your NPC as you go throughout the game, but outside of that you're able to send out a signal and call for help, kind of similar to how the SOS system works in Monster Hunter. Uh, players are able to have a preset list of conditions so you know whether it's uh, delineating specific levels of the game that they want to help in specific zones what have you players are able to set that and then as a signal comes in they can choose whether or not they want to jump into that game and help somebody in addition to that there is password matchmaking so you will be able to connect with your friends very easily however there is no pvp currently in the game no no dueling no invasions nothing of that sort but they did say that down the line it's something they are looking into so moving on from there, I wanted to know more about the NPCs. You know, are they just purely aesthetic and are you able to customize them to an extent or are they each unique with their own individual class? And what I was told is that NPC characters do have their own unique styles. You know, one may be a close range user with a sword, one could be a long range user that's a spellcaster. Uh, there's even NPCs that are almost purely support based where they don't do much fighting, but instead they focus on buffing the player. So there is a fair amount of variability between the NPCs, but each one is very much set into an archetype. Moving on from there, I talked about leveling and asked them how it works because I noticed as playing the game, when I leveled up, it would simply boost my health and my stamina pool, but I didn't notice my actual stats changing. And I was curious how that worked because there are uh, a couple different stats in the game, you know, stuff like strength, dex, willpower. And what I was told is that your stats are dictated by a combination of a couple different things. In particular, the style that you currently have active, which is basically your class your blood veil, which is essentially your armor, your weapon, and also any gifts that you have equipped. So those four things are all going to have an influence on your core stats, and they will change depending on what's used. So this is really cool to me, because in a sense, our stats are essentially modular, and we're able to freely mix up gear on the go to change our play style dynamically, which is a really interesting approach. Um, moving on from there, I asked them about the main hub because we did have a chance to check out the main hub in the demo, and I was curious if the game was going to be uh, more hub-based, where the hub is interconnected to everything, kind of similar to how Firelink worked, or if it was going to be more mission-based, like something like Neo, where you know your main hub is basically just a hangout zone, and then you depart off on other missions. And they said that the level design is very tightly tied into the story. So we're gonna be progressing through zones that are based on that point in the story and we can come back to the hub and revisit previous areas, but it is very much more guided level design than anything. As for bosses, I was curious about boss rewards and how those work, whether it's gonna be uh, specific key upgrade materials or what have you. And they mentioned that bosses will actually just drop the weapon outright. So when you defeat a boss, if that boss is using a weapon that's usable, it will get dropped and you can pick it right on up and begin using it immediately, which is really cool. Uh, in addition to that, I had a follow up on some of the bosses because I noticed that I was able to parry some bosses, but when I would parry a boss, it would work as a mitigation tool. It would stun them, but there wasn't a damage follow up. And I wanted to know how that worked whether or not we were going to see bosses that were essentially parry bait like Gwyn in Dark Souls 1. And what they said is that while you can parry a boss, it'll only do a short stun and you'll be unable to connect with the special attacks. So boss fights are still kind of very much that, that core ideology that we have in Souls games, where it's about memorizing movesets, dodging key attacks, attacking during openings, and stuff like that. And then in addition to that, I wanted to know if bosses have some type of strategy you can capitalize on, whether it's going to be a specific weakness, such as weakness to fire or magic or physical damage, or if everything is more balanced across the board because of this modular system. And they said that there, there is a fair amount of variation in the types of damage you're going to be able to do. Uh, stuff like bosses being weaker to key elements or attacks 
is something that's in the game, but the effects aren't so dramatic that you wouldn't be able to kill a boss with other means. Basically, if you're playing as a strength build, even if a boss is weaker to magic, you could still easily take that boss down with strength. You're not going to have to change your class. And then I followed up on that, asking them uh, in terms of, of uh, if the effects were game changers. And I brought up the example of the ogre in Sekiro, how if you lit the ogre on fire, you could essentially lock it down and kill it with very little difficulty. And I was curious if uh, we were going to mainly see damage differences in terms of weakness, or if we were going to see mechanic changing differences. And they said that it's not going to be a mechanical difference like in Sekiro. You'll be able to dish out more damage using a specific weakness, but we're not going to see any changes to the boss fight by using fire or something like that. So the advantages are something that speedrunners would want to take advantage of, but they're not going to be so drastic that your average player would have to change their playstyle to get past a boss. Moving on from there, I asked them about the endings, if we are looking at a multiple ending style game, and they said that you might see differences in the ending depending on how you play the game, but they don't want to give too much away at this point. So we are definitely looking at at least a couple playthroughs to get everything. And on that note, I also wanted to know what the case is with New Game Plus, and it was confirmed that there is New Game Plus. You carry over all your experience, all of your, your character items, your, your, uh, your classes that you have, weapons, stuff like that. Uh, moving on from there, I wanted to know how long the game was going to take, uh, both from a, a base level of just, you know, getting through and beating the game, as well as what they would expect it to take to basically get Platinum Trophy. And they said that if you were to play straight through, uh, start to finish, assuming you don't really get stuck at all, and, you know, you're, you're just kind of steadily progressing, they said they would expect the average player to take roughly 25 to 30 hours but this is excluding customization, optional areas, messing around with different classes and weapons. Um, they also said they don't have a specific time in mind for how long it would take to get a Platinum, but if you were to mess around with all the stuff and do all the optional content, it does add a significant amount of time into the game. So based on the discussion, I would assume that you know for two playthroughs, we're looking at an average of around 50 hours between knowing the game and trying out all the different classes and stuff, which I would say is pretty respectable for a game of this type. Moving on from there, I wanted to discuss the aesthetic of a little bit, because we've obviously all been referring to this as anime souls, so I asked them, I said, was there any particular anime or manga that you pulled inspiration from in the design of this game? And they said that there wasn't any specific title in particular, but more that the dev crew they were working with are very talented in the Japanese anime aesthetic, and because of that, they wanted to see how much they could capitalize on their talent. And so when they were discussing internally how they wanted to deliver that style, that's kind of how they came up with this 2D, 3D uh, anime visual aesthetic that we're seeing here in Code for Bane. Uh, I also confirmed the platforms. The game will be getting released on PC, Xbox One, and PS4. While there will be no Switch release initially, they said depending on sales, it may be something they look into. And as a closing question, I followed up on what his favorite weapon was, and Izika said that he is a huge fan of the pole arm, and as for the blood veil, he loves to use the stinger. So definitely some pretty interesting info, and it was pretty cool to, to get a chance to interview them. But with all that out of the way, let's talk about my thoughts regarding the game. So there's quite a bit that has changed with Code Vein, uh, and probably the biggest thing, in my opinion, is the overall experience and how much more guided it has become. And just to add a little clarity here, I'm not talking about, you know, they're not going to hold your hand through the entire game, but previously, Code Vein, the start of the game was very, very much like Dark Souls. They kind of just dropped you into it. You got a couple tool tips here or there regarding the combat, but they didn't really explain much. So for this discussion, I want to pull up a couple of kind of uh, basically this pamphlet we were given at the event. And as you can see, just with the controls, there's a lot going on. It's a lot more than just light attack, heavy attack, parry block. You know, you have your charged attacks, you have launched attacks, which you can do while you're under focus. You have both dash and dodge. You have drain, drain combo attacks, special attacks, all your gifts. And there is a lot mechanically going on to this game. And what they've essentially done is they took the start of the game and they completely revamped it and in a sense almost tutorialized it. And while I know Souls Likes are very famous for being you know, very difficult games, obviously, and they kind of just throw you into the shit and you got to figure it out on your own. I actually think this is a really good decision with Code Vein because there's a lot mechanically going on and it's significant enough that when I compare my experience this time after, you know, taking time to practice and fully grasp the combat system versus the last time I played, it's essentially like my first playthrough of Sekiro versus the walkthrough I did of Sekiro. Like, 
fully embracing and learning all the mechanics of the game makes a absolutely drastic difference on how effective you are. Learning about the focus system and how to do the launch attack during it. Huge game changer in fights when you're getting surrounded. Learning how to combo in the drain attack. Absolutely vital because it's going to pull in Iker so you can keep fueling your gifts. There's a lot going on in this game and especially considering the aesthetic of it I think this game will actually bring a lot of new players kind of into the soul sphere. I mean there's certainly a little bit of overlap between souls-like community and you know the the weeaboo fandom, if you will, but this game is going to fully embrace both of those communities, I think. So I think we're going to see a lot of people that have never really played a Souls-like before coming in, and to that extent, I think having a more tutorialized approach at the start of the game, instead of just throwing people into the shit, is a really good design decision. Uh, looking at a, a couple of the other things here, you can see the blood codes going on. These are the blood codes that we had available at the event. Fighter, which is kind of your, your straightforward warrior class. Um, quality, if you will, you know, has, has strength and dex type stuff. Uh, Ranger is more of a range class, focuses around support. And that was one of the things that was other interesting, is you can play almost entirely as like support and focus on your NPC being the one who does a lot of the damage. So there's there's a lot going on with this game. Uh, Caster, which is very much your range. You have the, the range gifts going on. Berserker, which is a focus around strength and endurance, but you get access to heavy armor, so you can just shrug off damage. Um, Prometheus is kind of your balance class all around. Uh, very good at dodging, has much higher mobility than other classes. Hunter is your ranged one, uh, uses the bayonet, can shoot bullets, has a, a bunch of different ranged gifts. Mercury is kind of your just overall right around the middle, balanced, and then of course Hermes, which has a wide variety of gifts, kind of a more of a uh, utility style class, if you will, has, you know, you're not going to excel with any one weapon, but you had a lot of different stuff available. And this is just the blood codes we had available at the event. I would assume there may be more in the game. I know uh, fighting one of the bosses in the game, they actually dropped a blood code for us. So there's a lot going on. And this is one of the biggest things that I took away from getting to play the game this time compared to the last. It's previously when I played, I was essentially playing through as a fighter, but I had a bunch of different gifts to work with. You know, I had that that build that was very similar to combustion. I had the the little the mini soul spear type thing, and now gifts have been split up between the classes to be a lot more individualized. So when I was playing as a fighter, uh, you know, my gifts focused around buffing my attack damage, uh, increasing my my health pool, you know, stuff like that. Whereas when I was playing as a caster, I didn't have any of that stuff, but instead. I had a lot of damage, and on top of that, I had a larger Iker stock so that I could cast this stuff more effectively. Going into something like the Berserker, I lost a lot of those gifts, but instead I gained stuff that would let me shrug off damage and increase my defense. So as opposed to, to classes being more, you know, um, I guess just everybody kind of having access to everything, now the Blood Codes have very much been specialized and each kind of has a very distinct feel to it, which I think is a much, much better approach than letting people just kind of do everything, because then, then, you know, everyone just turns into what's essentially a Havel monster. So now we see a lot more diversity in classes uh, in terms of how the game plays. Um, one of the biggest things that actually kind of kind of blew me away about this was the character customization, and I mean the actual character builder. Dude, I have never, never seen a character builder so in-depth in a Souls-like before. Like, it's not quite at, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's like Black Desert Online levels, but it's pretty freaking close. There is, like, I mean, just, just character faces. You had something like 20 different character faces to choose from, buttloads of hairstyles, full color wheel with, with different color shades and stuff, all these different little accessories you could put on your character. The amount of character customization is at levels of super hype, and I know people are going to make all kinds of, of yes, mean characters from it. Which I think is, you know, it's, it's something that we're kind of known for in this community. So I think people are gonna gonna really vibe with that. Uh, in terms of the raw gameplay, the raw gameplay hasn't really changed all that much. Um, you know, the the dodge mechanics have mixed up a little bit. Like depending on your class now, you see different mobility on dodges. Uh, the berserker, for example, kind of has like a fat roll. Um, you know, the, the, using as the fighter, I kind of have what would be like a mid roll, and then some of the lower classes you have uh, it changes more into like a bloodborne dash, where you just straight up dip out and avoid taking damage from moves by by having that increased mobility and being able to get out of the way. So we're seeing you know even more more uh, specialization between class there, not just in your fighting style, but also in your mobility, the amount of Iker you have, the amount of gifts you have. 
Um, but I did find it pretty interesting. I, I played the majority of my time as a fighter, did a little bit messing around as a berserker, tried out some of the, the other gifts, but didn't play with them too much. Uh, you are able to change your gifts around pretty freely. Pretty much any time you are at a mistle, which are this game's version of bonfires, and you're resting, you're able to change up your gifts. But or excuse me, change up your, your blood codes. But what's interesting is you need to, all the experience that you get can go to two things. You can either level up with it or you can unlock gifts for your blood code, but you need to actually spend it for that. So if I'm playing as a fighter and I've unlocked a bunch of his different gifts and I decide to switch over to a berserker, I'm not gonna have any berserker gifts. So while you are able to freely change your blood code around and try out different classes, unless you're willing to invest the time to really spend time farming, and uh, you know, getting the XP to unlock all the gifts, you will see a weakness between the classes because you're, you're obviously going to have uh, you're going to have more gifts unlocked for one class compared to another. So I thought that was pretty interesting because it gives the players the ability. And the thing is, you know, gifts aren't like levels. So you know, whereas you know, when you level up, the the amount you need to level is always going to increase. You know, if I'm up to like level 40 and I decide suddenly, hey, you know, I think I want to switch things up and try out a caster. The caster gifts aren't going to suddenly cost thousands of experience. They're going to cost the same amount as if I had started playing the game as a caster. So the base level ones will still be cheap, but getting the higher level caster gifts are going to be correspondingly to expensive just as much as it would have been uh, to you know, get higher level warrior stuff. So I definitely think, I mean, it, uh, more than anything, I just want, I want the damn game right now. You know, I had a lot of fun playing it. Um, what you're seeing right now. This, this area that we're going through right here is essentially this alternate dungeon that we were able to go on into. And I, I didn't have enough time to get through the whole thing, but it was called the Depths. And there were three different paths you had to go down. Each of those paths had a boss. After you beat all three bosses, you got a key, and that was able to unlock the door to go to this, this big boss. And so there's a couple different kind of optional dungeon style areas throughout the game. Uh, what I found really interesting about this area in particular is we were able to get access to it fairly early in the game. And you know, you've probably you've probably noticed you're like, man, Cowboy's getting his, his ass beat. And it's because I'm going through this area at like level 10, level 15, and this is supposed to be like I think they said it was like a level 30 dungeon. So for the most part, stuff in here I'm just not supposed to be fucking with at this point. But you know, between both myself and my NPC, I was able to take stuff out. And then on top of that, you probably noticed I'm getting a buttload of experience, which I think is really cool because you can essentially go into areas that may be beyond your means to go in initially um, and you're going to struggle through but it gives you access to areas that are super dope farming if you want to try and tackle that challenge early on. So mixing things up a little bit, going to be sharing some alternative footage with you guys. This is actually courtesy of Ruricon. Uh, we ended up swapping some footage around. I gave him some of my fighter stuff and he gave me some of his caster stuff just so we could check out the gameplay differences. Uh, but anyway, jumping back into it, you know, I've talked uh, a lot about what they've improved and what I've enjoyed, but I haven't really been too critical. And there was one really major thing, and that was death animations. Um, you know, thinking about Dark Souls as an example, when you kill something in Dark Souls, it's very much like you're cutting a string, and the enemy immediately goes limp. And in Code Vein, that's not exactly the case. Taking this enemy right here as an example, you notice that, like, you know, I get the death blow, and even then he's still standing for a second, and then he collapses, and he goes through his death animation, and, like, his essence fades. And it didn't happen with every enemy, but when it did happen, it was a bit of a, a visual discrepancy, I guess you could say. Um, probably one of the, the best ways to put it is, you know, getting in these fights, what I found myself doing more often than not is I was paying closer attention to the health bar of an enemy as opposed to having that visual indication of the enemy died. And actually, I had a chance to, to talk to some of the people about the event at it, and I was like, you know, that seems kind of wonky. And they were like, well... You know, the reasoning behind it is they, they really wanted to preserve the death animation and the enemy, you know, because everything you're fighting here is essentially something that was a human that's become blood crazed and because of that it transforms into whatever you want to call these guys, ghouls, what have you. And so it's, it's the whole animation of them dying and their essence being released and they wanted to preserve that aesthetically. And while I understand it, it was still visually off-putting when I would, you know, get that hit on something and it wouldn't immediately drop. Kind of going back to the, the other example I said with Souls, you know, Souls has a, a ragdoll style system. And when, basically as soon as a target's health hits zero, it's like the string they were dancing on was snipped. And they just drop. The body goes limp, you can kick him around and play soccer with him, whatever you want. And 
you know, I don't miss playing soccer with the bodies here, but not seeing that body drop as soon as you got that last hit definitely was a little bit off-putting to me, especially because we've gotten so used to that in, in you know, all these Souls-like games. Um, aside from that, though, that's that's definitely my, my top complaint. Um, aside from that, I didn't really have anything that I disliked about the game. I mean, the classes felt really diverse. The weapons felt pretty diverse. Uh, I will say that, you know, as expected, using your, your big boy heavy weapons, you can do a bunch of damage, but you're, you're slow as balls. Um, well, it's not, well, it's not a bad thing, and I think this would probably change once I get veils for the Berserker, but I felt like using the big weapons wasn't really worth it. You know, I did a lot of my time either with the Great Hammer or the Great Sword that I found, and while I was able to do some serious chunking to enemies, at the same time, I didn't... You know how, like, when you play as a strength build in Dark Souls, I guess the best way to, to, to put it is, when you play as that strength build, you know, I don't care if I'm getting hit, because I'm going to chunk this boss. And in this game, while I was still chunking that boss, or chunking that enemy, or whatever, the hits I was taking, I was like, oh my god, my health! I can't afford to take these hits, you know? It felt like... It felt like trying to, to play Dark Souls using an Ultra Greatsword, but wearing light armor. It just didn't work, so... Um, you know, just based on my experience, I wasn't really a fan of that. But, like I said, I didn't have access to a heavy armor veil, a, like, a, a uh, you know, pure strength style beefy boy veil. And I think if I did have one, that the experience would have probably been different. So, all in all, I would say that, that as of now, this is, this is definitely on my hype list. Um, not as high as Borderlands 3, because that was... I was absolutely blown away about everything in that game. But Code Vein is definitely looking to be a big, big title for 2019. And more than anything, I'm glad Bandai took the time to actually, you know, go back, uh, you know, flesh out the tutorial, polish the game a bit. Because, I mean, let's, let's be honest here. We all know that the Souls community is super, super critical. And if they had released this game and there were, like, hiccups and all kinds of shit in it, dude, people would have torn it the fuck apart. People would have buried it. It would have been, like, you know, Molotov cocktails getting thrown at Bandai Namco because people weren't happy with it. So, Anime Souls is looking like it's going to be a very, very solid game when it eventually drops. Unfortunately, I was not able to pry a release date out of them. I tried as best as I could, could not get them to give it up. Uh, what I do know, confirmed, is that the game, if they said it is being released in 2019, no more random delays. We haven't been given a date yet, but we do know 2019. So my bet is that they're probably going to announce a release date at E3. I've been saying for a while now, you know, info's coming at E3. Well, you know, info's here already because it's your boy. But the point is, we should be getting a release date soon. Um, just based on, on sales and quarters, I would guess they're probably going to aim for an October or November release. Just because traditionally, Q4 is always the biggest time of year with releases. I would say they're either going to do that, or they're going to try and beat the Q4 rush and go for like an August release. Now, if they do an August release, that would be fucking awesome. But... I would be genuinely surprised, because usually you don't see big games drop right around that time. Um, and traditionally, Bandai has Bandai has a history of trying to aim their releases usually around Q1, usually in like the, the February, March time frame, sometimes in April. So, you know, it's kind of up in the air, but just going on what we know about the games industry in general, either Q4, that, that September, October, November, December sphere, or, or right before it, that is usually the the hot time when we see releases coming out because people want to get those games out and get that Christmas money that we're going to spend. So, either way, I'm hyped for it. Um, no idea what I'm going to play. I really like playing as Berserker, but you know, until until I get access to a heavy veil, um, not sure how well that's going to work out. Like, I'm looking at the, at a uh, Rui's gameplay though. I will. I am I'm very inclined to agree that uh, Caster seems to be pretty bonkers. Like, looking at this fireball thing he does, that's a pretty fucking hefty chunk. And I could probably do that chunk with my greatsword, but I'd also be getting bonked in the face at the same time. So, I'm not really sure, but I, I do think that one of the things I'm most excited about with this game is after having a chance to uh, dabble more into the blood coat system and you know, playing around with changing classes. I don't think I'll be shy at all because, you know, I'm, I'm no stranger to farming, so I'd be more than fine with coming down into the depths like this and just farming up the stuff I need to unlock uh, various codes. And then, or not codes, but um, 
you know, your gifts, and then trying out a bunch of different classes. So I'll probably end up playing through a bunch of different classes in a single playthrough, but more than likely, I'll probably end up focusing around strength. Uh, I do want to at least try out more of a quality dex build because, you know, since the producer said that the polearm was such an awesome weapon, I haven't actually used the polearm at all. So I'm like, all right, man, well, if it's, if it's this guy's favorite weapon, I, you know, I got to check it out. I got to see what makes the polearm so spicy. So anyway, guys, that is going to wrap this one on up. As I mentioned, uh, I'm going to have three other videos that won't really have commentary. I'll do an introduction in each of them, but they're, they're very much just going to be my, my first experience with what we played at the demo, roughly an hour and a half of footage. But I'll let this one close on out. You guys can see how the boss fight ends here. Fortunately, I don't think Rui's going to pull it off because he's playing as a caster and he is completely bone dry on Iker and boop, there it is. But either way, guys, thanks for coming on by and checking out Code Vein. I'll have a link to Rui's channel as well, uh, both in the comments section and the description. But either way, thanks for coming on by and I'll catch you guys next time.